is that they no longer have to walk in and get lucky. So before it was, did I walk into the right building? Did I get the right case manager? Does that case manager happen to know where there's an open housing unit in our system? What we've done now is we've standardized the way we determine what type of housing you need, and we maintain the, a real-time database of available units in our system. So that housing navigator, no matter who they are, can look in our system, identify a unit that's available for this individual. The other element that we built into that system was choice. So in a city like Houston, where um, we are so uh, large and geographically dispersed, that where these individuals live is often important to them because they have support systems in particular parts of the city. So having a real-time database allows them to make a selection about available housing based on meeting some of their additional support needs like connection to family or you know, my clinic that I go to for mental health treatment is in this part of town. I want to go live over there. So that really, I would say, are the two elements that have changed the experience the most for the consumer. Um, what it's translated into is very rapid housing placement. So before, we would encounter an individual, if you got lucky and had the right case manager, it, we would spend weeks then re-engaging you, working that system. Tracking trying, you down. Tracking you down. <laughs> hundreds of man hours just trying to find someone in this big city of Houston. Um, so what has changed now is that when we encounter that individual at the Beacon right now, who's coming to the Beacon for services, we've been able to get them housed as rapidly as seven days with this new system. So from assessment to move-in in seven days. Um, that won't always be the case, but our goal overall as a system is no more than 30 days between assessment and move-in. Um, that's the metric we're reaching for, and this system will, will get us there. So are you expecting the homeless to actually go into the beacon and say, well, I'm looking for a place to stay or, because right now there's a big surge in very young homeless people, and they're right in front of City Hall, all right? And, and throughout the city, there are more and more young people that are out there that are homeless. But I can't imagine a, a homeless person going into the beacon and say, I need a house like I'm looking for in a hotel. Absolutely. That's what, they're, that's what, that's what we're, we're doing today. And we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have housed the uh, 1,400 people, chronically homeless people that, uh, because someone is mentally ill or because someone is, uh, has a substance abuse problem, doesn't mean that they don't recognize that they are better off if they can find a, a safe, secure place to live. I'll also challenge you a little bit, Tony, on the idea of like folks who congregate outside City Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be marginally housed, they may be couch surfing, but a lot of the people you see that we, we say, oh, well, there's all these homeless outside City Hall, that they are not, in fact, homeless. They are um, they're hanging out uh, with their buddies. Uh, some of them doing things they probably shouldn't be doing out there. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to continue to work with them as well. I mean, because the goal is going to be that uh, anybody who is, that, that no one is on the streets of Houston. When we say our goal is to eliminate chronic homelessness, no one is on the streets of Houston because there aren't the resources or the ability or the will to get them placed in the uh, appropriate so, Mayor, has the actual housing stock increased, or are you more Absolutely. efficiently but putting them places? The, 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 could you, could you the, total number of the, the total number of housing units, uh, permanent supportive housing beds for chronically homeless has increased, but the efficiency of using the system. Uh, one of the first things that our downtown... Where do they go? One of, the first, one of the first things that the homeless leadership team got from Mandy was a, a dashboard where we had every agency that had that receives federal dollars, for example, and maybe grant doll other types of uh, nonprofit dollars as well for housing homeless individuals. What their uh, what type of individuals they generally house and how many open beds they had, and uh, there were dozens and dozens of open beds across the city of Houston. And those beds were open for long periods of time because A, the right person couldn't figure out how to get to that particular bed, and B, which is another issue, uh, the agencies wanted someone who fit a particular demographic that they were looking for. And we had to say, well, we'll get you people in those beds faster, but some of you were putting too much restriction on the individual you know, housing uh, units that you have. You, 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 know, you, you, don't, you don't get to... You don't have the luxury, we don't have the luxury of you getting the uh, uh, 
a man between the ages of you know, 30 and 40 who, had, who doesn't have this problem but might have that problem. This is about moving the needle. Mayor, I will say though, Mayor, just to push it back on that just a little bit, is that I guess since they're redoing Allen Park uh, or the area by the Spaghetti Warehouse, and they have that place uh, wired. A lot of the homeless used to kind of congregate there. They've been sort of pushed out. So I would say some people who frequent downtown, you might say there are fewer homeless, but if you're the average person walking down the street, you might not feel like there's fewer homeless. How do you address that issue? There in true, absolute numbers. Uh, the number of homeless across the city of Houston is, is down by, by more than 25%, maybe as much as, as a quarter, uh, I, I mean 30%, and um, maybe begins to approach 50%. The, you've identified a, and we'll have the exact numbers in a couple of weeks, but you've identified a problem is that, in that, you know, downtown is redeveloping. A lot of places where the homeless may have congregated, suddenly there's a construction zone and, and they, are, they are pushed out, and so they may be concentrating in a fewer number of places. But that doesn't mean that the, so you see them visibly there, but that doesn't mean the number has gone up. The number has absolutely gone down. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a meeting with uh, property owners around the Beacon. Uh, and thanks to Mandy and, and, and her team, uh, we've, and the Beacon and the property owners, we've, we've worked through some protocols on how to um, how to make that situation there a little bit better. For example, uh, more and more, as we consolidate services, more and more people are showing up at the Beacon for that entry point into the system. But with Beacon open, open at 8 in the morning, and now they're opening at what, 7? Yeah, seven, open at 9. They opened at 9, and so and you had to be the first in the door, and so the homeless would start lining up hours in advance, and so the folks who are coming to, to work in that area are walking around homeless people and they say, oh my gosh, the number of homeless has gone up. No, they're there for a particular reason. Well, the solution to that is to expand the hours to the beacon, make it where you don't have to be there, first one in line, fifth one in line in order to receive services, spread out the services over the course of the day, and have a better system for everybody. And those are the kind of solutions we're working on. Mary, you talked about making the housing system more efficient, getting people into the beds. Um, is there is there a point uh, at which we need some of the construction work that was planned for the permanent permanent support of housing units to come online to keep the momentum that we that we have? We've been presenting to to council and Mandy, come talk the exact numbers at 25, 2,400. Let's see. So, yeah, so yeah, so our goal is to add an additional 2,500 units of permanent supportive housing, um, and we've been able to add a, over 50 percent of that stock into our pipeline now. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there are some projects coming online here soon that are new construction projects um, and that we do need to really push through to help support these projects um, uh, all the way into implementation because the, those units are going to be very critical for us. What's most important about those units is that they come with the most robust set of services. And so that, those units are really going to be what enable us to continue to house these very vulnerable, very chronically homeless individuals so we can get them off the streets um, and, and into housing successfully. Mandy, I, I started 